Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Within Summit and Fireside Chat with Amanda Coughlin. Amanda is a licensed professional counselor and CEO of Coughlin Consulting. She's a mental health entrepreneur and thought leader who creates innovative solutions to fill gaps in the mental health care system. In 2014, Amanda created and developed an idea for a mental health urgent care clinic and sold it in 2016 to create Coughlin Consulting a nationwide concierge mental health treatment team service. Amanda is passionate about helping people achieve mental wellness and creating sustainable support systems and solutions which integrate seamlessly into real life. She is a speaker and a nationally recognized consultant who specializes in creating unique treatment plans for patients struggling with psychological concerns such as addiction, eating disorders, lack of motivation, and other issues impacting mental wellness. Amanda, thank you for being here. It's so good to have you. Thank you for inviting me. So today we're going to have a conversation around in-home coaching. You know, I think that there's so much alignment in treatment philosophies here at Within Health and the work that you're doing within home coaching. It was really fun to listen to Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt talk this morning about how much her passion for income coaching inspired the idea for Within Health. Tell me more about how this whole thing started for you. What inspired you to go down this path of in-home coaching? I think it's twofold. I think part of it is my professional trajectory. I worked at an alternative to incarceration program in New York um, for my first job out of grad school. So we took these kids and we went into the projects where most of them lived. And if they, you know, had families, we were involved with the family, probation, courts, schools, gangs, friends, like anyone involved with that kid, we were involved with them. And I really began to understand how to create change within systems and why taking an individual outside of their system will never create change because we all want to belong and we do what we can to acclimate back to the system that we're a part of. And so that was one side of the path. The other side was my own experience of having an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to my dietitian, I would go to my therapist, I would go to like the fitness trainer that I had. And it was like, I could not manage to do it at home because there's the logical and then there's the emotional and the emotional typically overrides when you're just, your amygdala is hijacked in the moment and you can't, you know exactly what you need to do, but you just can't get yourself to do it. And so um, I would always say if my team was there when I actually needed them, my life could have looked a lot different. And so all of my businesses that I've created, I know I'm not some unicorn where it's like I'm the only one in the world that feels that way. And so I knew if I had that experience, then other people must too. And so if I could help people cut a couple of years or even decades off of their recovery, what could it do for their quality of life and them reaching their full potential for the years that they had left? So really kind of bringing your own lived experience into what's the next step in treatment. And so based on that, what are some of the things that you would highlight as differences between a traditional treatment setting and the in-home recovery coaching model? I mean, it's night and day. So I think like I, I talk about treatment with clients in terms of college, right? You go to college, you get an education, there's things you do in the lab for science class or for Spanish class or, you know, whatever. and then you know, after that, you end up going, you graduate, and then you have an internship, you have a supervisor for that, and somebody now overseeing you in the context of actually applying what you've learned and helping you to pivot on the spot so that you can make those corrections and that you're not just in this sink or swim kind of place. And um, being able to hone in on the, like, the small details that you may not even be aware of because we're all blind to our blind spots. And so when you have somebody who's right there with you during the application period, that's that's the thing. Like this is not always a replacement for treatment. It's a uh, it's a complementary piece and a next step of treatment. And I love that analogy, you know, folks that are listening in today, some of them may be in the treatment world, some of them may be eating disorder providers and clinicians who kind of 
understand the framework of eating disorder recovery, but there may be people that are tuning in who are new to eating disorders. And so having that analogy of thinking of it as school and thinking of it as an internship, I think really allows people to have an understanding of how you're really kind of meeting folks where they are. I know as a dietitian, when I was in my internship, having feedback in real time around things that I did that, you know, would be good to continue to repeat versus having feedback around, you know, maybe we should try that again and we can do this a different way. It definitely helped guide me in real time to feel more confident in my work. And so I can imagine as a, you know, a person in recovery, having that immediate feedback and having that validation around things that I'm doing that are moving me towards recovery versus having help being able to restructure things in a different way can really help guide someone in a really efficient way going forward. A hundred percent. And think about like, whether you're in recovery, talking to your counselor or your treatment team, or whether you're that intern talking to your supervisor, we all filter through our own lens and perspective. And so if we're talking to somebody in an office, one, we're talking about the things important to us, even if we're not trying to leave out important information to them, we're talking about the things important to us. And we're talking through our own perception versus somebody else being a witness to the things that we miss for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, at Within Health, we incorporate recovery coaching pretty consistently throughout programming. Care, Care partners are going to be helping with a lot of meal support. You know, we have food specialists who are in the home and kind of helping folks with coming up with, you know, what am I gonna eat today? When I think about recovery coaching and when I talk to our coaches, you know, every client's unique, every day is different because every home environment is gonna be different. What are some of the challenges that you run into and kind of the in-home recovery coaching model? Because it's not a controlled treatment setting, right? Like there's going to be a lot of opportunity for challenges to come up as every home space is going to be different. Yeah, I think family dynamics would be one of the most complicating factors because some parents are either overly protective like you're pushing them too much you're pushing them too much or you know they're like why can't you just do it or they might want you to just fix their kid and so a lot of the times people in this field will look at parents as support people but the truth is drowning people can't save drowning people and these are traumatized people doing their best to keep their kid above water and In the world of eating disorders, the first thing you do as a parent is you feed your child. And so think about the distress that causes to a parent who's no longer able to feed their child and the desperation that comes up in them, the issues that come up in them. And now those are being acted out in the moment and everybody in that system is in crisis and they need somebody to come in and hold the whole system versus relying on traumatized people to support traumatized people. I love that you're bringing up that that family aspect because you're right. Treatment doesn't happen alone. And it's important to be able to provide that wraparound support around a whole family system. And as an in-home recovery coach, you don't just have one client. It sounds like you're kind of taking on and supporting a whole family. You know, when you were talking about those analogies, I think back to some of the family coaching that we do, that our nurses do with our clients at Within. And it's kind of like, I think, they use analogies for parents who approach their child's eating disorder as like, are we going to kind of be a bull where we're like a bull in the China shop, right? Where you're kind of like taking charge or are you a um, putting your head in the sand? Are you an ostrich where you're kind of ignoring everything that's happening around you? Like, how do you kind of help families become more of the dolphin where they're that gentle nudger of helping them kind of guide forward where you're helping provide boundaries And those kind of loving boundaries and helping to provide support um, without feeling like you're taking ownership of their recovery. I think always relating back to something they know is important because that is the place where uh, experience meets competence and then they build confidence. And so a lot of the families we work with are entrepreneurs. And so we talk about how do you coach somebody along who's an employee 
who isn't meeting the standards. And some parents are like, just fire them. And I'm like, well, you can't fire every like this is a team. You can't fire people on the team, you know? But like, how do you build somebody up to help them meet expectations when you can't fire them? So um being able to also talk about how accountability roles and expectations are critical to helping people meet that and vocalizing those and having different kinds of metrics Mm -hmm. where everybody is on the same page. And so we start talking about the family as a business and um, we create a family mission that everybody participates in. We have an accountability chart where everybody has clearly defined roles and responsibilities. We have a scorecard where everybody has goals and a way to support each other in reaching those goals. So we really start to transform the family to becoming a working team versus this division of, Mm -hmm. I want you to do something and you're not doing it. Or, you know, how could you hurt yourself? Or do you see what you're doing to us? Or this blame and shame game in order to create change, because we know for sure that blaming and shaming doesn't help people come together and it doesn't move people forward. I love that. You know, I think about these different family systems that you're referring to, And one of the aspects of in-home care that allows this kind of unique way of meeting folks where they are, you know, it's this really kind of truly unique environment where you're seeing people that are in their homes and that are in their family systems, that are in their, their triggers, their challenges, but also in their kind of circles of support and things that, that help and comfort them. Can you talk a little bit about your ability to kind of tailor an individual approach depending on who you're working with. You know, you and I had an opportunity to have a little bit of a conversation about this before where you think about folks that are on kind of completely different end of the, end of the spectrum, whether it's a neurodivergent client whose needs might be vastly different from someone who is maybe struggling with ARFID or binge eating. And so tell me a little bit more about some of the things, some of the things that you've noticed in your work where you've had folks with very different presentations and how you can kind of like uniquely tailor a way to meet them where they are. Yeah, I think it, I'm a quality of life entrepreneur. And, um, you know, I think that We are in a society where we so often have to be who others want us to be in order to be accepted. And there are plenty of places where you can actually belong. But uh, the messages we get from our parents or from different facets of society take us off that trajectory. And I'm a big believer that purpose, passion, and community are the three keys to thriving. And so when I sit down with somebody, I really want to understand what does your ideal life look like? And um, some people are more introverted, some people are more extroverted and just, you know, with their eating disorder or with any other form of mental health, uh, it just kind of shrunk and they became less and less of who they were. And so it's getting people back in alignment with who they really are and then putting these other things back in their proper place, whether it's food or, you know, like removing substances and finding better ways of coping. But um people like people with autism for instance aren't gonna want to do things in groups and they're not like they're gonna find every conversation um boring and trite when it's around superficial things like pop culture that a lot of people want to talk about so then it's like okay well if conversations are hard for you, but you want to socialize, maybe we go to a chess club where you can engage in an activity and talk about this common interest that you have. And socializing doesn't have to look the same for everybody. So where somebody won't do well talking about feelings and they want to talk about an intellectual topic, we click them in with that so they could start to feel fulfilled. And somebody who wants to talk about more deep conversations and braid each other's hair and do the slumber party like we're going to click them in with things that work for them I love that you know I think that's one of the things that we value as well in terms of creating milieus right that are going to help someone be in an environment that's going to support their recovery 
And so being able to kind of think really individually around what type of milieu, what type of interactions are going to be to help kind of bring them out and help them feel included is huge. It's very huge. I want to bring us to a QA. and I think that this is helpful for to kind of level set some expectations and understanding around the, the in-home coaching that you provide with um, Copland Consulting. So this is from Dee Dee and she says, how does home therapy look? Do you go to your patient's house? Can you describe what a day is like? And I think that this would be really fun um, for people to be able to, to hear more about what a day in the life is like, because that was one of my big questions for you too. And definitely I'm encouraging people to continue to come to the chat and come to the um, Q&A if you have specific questions that you want to learn more about. Yeah. I So there's a difference between therapy and coaching. And I think that's really, really important. Um, and so coaching is really about understanding how the past created patterns we could learn from in order to help people move forward in a different way versus digging deep into the why and the trauma and the, you know, serious issues. So just to kind of flesh those two things out, um, you know, we have done in-home therapy, but that is more an hour in someone's house and go home versus the coaching. And so every coach is different. They have their different personalities. We always say this isn't Starbucks. Like you can't just have the same thing everywhere you go and have that work. Um, but I am like, I'm the kind of person that wants to engage and build relationships with everyone in the family. And um, so I'll have scheduled bonding time with each person in the family so that we can build a relationship on their terms and things that work for them. And then when moments are hard, I could lean on that relationship because we built it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a boy who was very, very into DJing. And so we'd get up every morning and have our morning rave to start the day. And I would jump on the couch and throw my hands in the air and he'd throw his hands in the air like it was a big crowd. And then we'd game plan for the day. But this was also a kid who wasn't getting out of bed before. And, you know, he just hated himself so much. He couldn't even look in the mirror and would crawl on the floor to get in the shower to avoid the mirror. And so incorporating little things like that, where it's like, people are like, oh, okay, well, it's insignificant. That's bringing life back into his day. And so it's the little things every day that help somebody get out of bed or meet their therapeutic goals that the therapist may not understand from an office. Why can't they do it? Well, okay. If we schedule a morning rave for five minutes every day and then go about our day and that helps him, great. So um, then there are people where they just never want to leave the house. And so the goal is, okay, can we get out once today to the park? Or how do we work our way into the grocery store? Or, how, you know, these little incremental steps to get them through. And we may hang out and watch movies. I mean, normal days don't have a whole lot of exciting things for most of us. And so we're just trying to get people to normal days and then have the exciting things in between the purpose, the passion, the community. And if we could reintegrate those or integrate them even for the first time, then that's pretty much what a day looks like. Sorry if I made people jump. My dog knocked over my lamp, but <laughs> um. So I want to come back to one of the things that you had mentioned about this isn't therapy, you know, this is coaching and being very clear about the difference between the two. One of the things that I think is really important to highlight is that a coach works really closely as part of an integral multidisciplinary team. And there was an analogy that you used that I want to bring back here, where we had talked about the multidisciplinary treatment team, which may include, you know, a dietitian and a therapist med management provider, a PCP, they may be creating a treatment plan. And you talked about in-home coaching as being the like special ops boots on the ground. I loved that analogy so much um, where, you know, there's the, you're collaborating with the treatment team in terms of what those objectives look like. And then you're kind of on the ground helping carry those out with the patient in real time. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I always say we are the Navy SEALs of behavioral health coaches. And, <laughs> to, you know, to, to the point, I got my live-in team certified as hostage negotiators because every single thing that we do 
is negotiation. If I want you to eat, you don't want to eat, we're negotiating. If you want to kill yourself, I don't want you to, we're negotiating. And so if you could understand how to negotiate in a way that moves people forward, then you can use the skill set you have therapeutically or as a trained professional in order to then get them into a place where they're making progress. But, um, you know, being the Navy SEALs, the behavioral health coaches, what that means is that there's a strategic team behind us as we're going in to do the tactical boots on the ground uh, execution of the strategy of the higher ups, and we're relaying information back so that the team is aware of the things they're missing from their one hour at a time in an office. And now they could create better strategies because they're seeing how uh, the strategy meets the reality to create a new data point. I think you need t-shirts that say that, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Like Navy SEALs and behavioral health coaching. I think that <laughs> needs to be a t-shirt. <laughs> yes. All right. So let's kind of piggyback on this. As we're talking about coaching and multidisciplinary care, what are some of the common misconceptions that you run into around coaching? You know, I think the world of addiction, they have sober coaches. And a lot of the times the people are just people in recovery, you know, and they have 12 steps and, and their toolbox. And that's the main one. And if you can't 12 step it away, then you're not trying hard enough or, you know, it's like kind of blaming the person. Um, and a hammer isn't the right tool for every job. And so um, I think the understanding that these aren't just people in recovery our our coaches specifically are highly trained people like some of them have counseling degrees some of them are dietitians some of them you know have done a lot of work in treatment centers from starting as a behavior tech to supervising behavior tech so they understand working with treatment professionals in the center to implement the things in the milieu um but you know i think that coaching is kind of the wild west right now and everyone's a coach and so it could get really confusing on what does it mean to be a coach? Mm. Okay. So when you're, when you, let's expand on that. So when you're talking about the wild west and a lot of people are confused on what it means to be a coach, do you run into maybe some of your clients or families at maybe having an idea of what services you provide versus their conception of what income coaching can look like? I think everybody has this radical idea of what it looks like to have a stranger move in with you um some people are like is this like tony robbins coming to live with me like is this like what do you do all day do you follow me around are you a shadow um people have a lot of questions and misconceptions of what that looks like mm -hmm. but we're living life side by side with people and we're not trying to create a higher level of dependence we're trying to create more independence so if they're already doing certain things independently go forth go keep doing it you know we yeah. want to build from there not be trapped from there so um but yeah people seem to have these wild misconceptions of what it looks like to have somebody live with you or work with you as a coach and so it sounds like things that are helpful are just very clear communication around kind of what are your objectives of being there and what is the client wanting to get out of it? What are the things that you guys are working on together? Um, and just having clear communication around the things that, you know, ways that you can support. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we do an assessment that's like probably five hours all in all. So we're talking to the person of concern, a family member, treatment team members, we create a coaching plan, go back and give them the coaching plan, ask if anything needs to be pivoted, you know, but um, it creates this alignment before we ever go in so that everybody knows what to expect. We're on the same page. And one of the questions in our assessment is, what are you willing to do to get the goals you, you say you want for yourself? And what I learned early on is people are like, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. And you're like, great. Let's set this boundary. They're like, okay, hey, not that. <laughs> so being able to ask people up front, what are you willing to do? Um, because it doesn't matter how much you pay. It doesn't matter how much you want it. If you're not willing to be uncomfortable too, this probably won't work. And I want to be upfront about that so that I don't, I don't sell, uh, I don't sell these goods that people are like, this is not what I bought. 
you know, like you were supposed to fix my kid. You were supposed to fix my spouse. You were supposed to fix me. Like not how it works. Yeah. You know, I want to, to make sure that I ask this question. I know we're have about five minutes left and I want to invite anybody to add any additional questions into the chat, but looking ahead, kind of where do you see in-home coaching going? And when we look at the landscape of eating disorder treatment, I feel like there's a lot of innovations and changes and ways that we're reaching people and ways that we're helping patients access care. Um, where do you see in-home coaching kind of fitting into that? You know, there's a lot of different movements in treatment philosophy, um, anti-carceral and, um, you know, community-based settings. And it's going to be very interesting to see how the treatment industry overall shifts. Um, but I think that more and more people who are struggling at their very core are lonely. And having that connection of somebody with you in the moment helps ease that loneliness and provides the support that people need to move forward because if it was as easy as a skill, they wouldn't need any of us. They'd be reading a CBT manual and their lives would be awesome. I mean, how many self-help books are there that are out there right now that you could read? And if you actually applied it, your life would be dramatically different. Yeah. But we need more than words. Yeah. We need connection. And that's where coaching comes in. You know, I think that that piece of it is so important, you know, when you talk about the connection piece and you talk about being able to meet people where they are, to work alongside them, to develop those relationships. Um, here at Within Health, we call it lovingly intrusive. <laughs> I like that. Right? And just talk repeatedly about how much we meet our clients with with so much care and love and concern and it's in that relationship piece that things start to shift and it's really amazing to be able to have you as a resource out there doing this work and just how grateful I know that we are for the ways that you have continued to kind of be a mover and shaker in the mental health sphere and being able to think outside the box you know I loved when we were kind of reading through your bio and this thought leader who creates innovative solutions to fill gaps in the mental health care system, like that's a sentence, but it's something that's profound and not easy to do to stand alone in those spaces to say, hey, this is this is a gap in care and this is where we need support. And the work that you're doing to kind of put yourself out there and to make those changes is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. What are some of the things that, you know, when you have people that are here listening, they're in different phases of their career. You have people that are in school. You have people that are um, entry-level positions that are just meeting with patients for the first time. Um, and then you have patients that are seasoned providers who have been made a career out of working with eating disorders. What advice do you have for professionals that are in the field of eating disorders or maybe just kind of getting to work with patients in the beginning? I think be very clear on your own mission and be very clear on your own desires because I think that, you know, my my main mission is to help as many people as I can achieve their full potential. And so, um, you know, that could look very different. It doesn't always look like their symptoms change immediately or, you know, like you have to gauge your own success on something that you have control over or you're going to burn out. And there are many ways you could pivot and do that from a treatment center to your private practice to like a uh, ecosystem of care that you've created with other private practice people to being in a home with a client and living with them. But just as long as you're clear on what your mission is, there are many ways to live it and pivot and, um, you know, don't box yourself in. Something that you said in that sentence too, that spoke so loudly to me, and I'm going to try to rephrase it, is to not gauge kind of your own success on things that are outside of your control. So being very clear around what your objectives are, why you're here, why you're doing this work, and letting that center the care that you provide is huge. 
Amazing. Thank you. Well, I know You're that welcome. We're thank you. almost at time, but thank you all for being here. My name is Ryan Sobis and I am outreach supporting North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia and Amanda, I appreciate you signing in. And if there's anything that we can do to be a support, don't hesitate to reach out. Same.